So I'm going to ask Brother Waddell if you'll come on at this time here and let he's going to say a few words about Providence Baptist College and the young ladies will uh, come and sing for us and uh, enjoy a little bit of singing before we get into our message tonight. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. As the pastor said, my name is Mason Waddell and I am a representative from Providence Baptist College. Now, I heard that you all had another Bible college through uh, either this last week or the week before. And every church that I go to, I encourage people, especially young people, to consider Bible college. Providence Baptist College is not the only good Bible college that is out there. There are others, but it is a good Bible college. Some of the things I like about Providence is we have preachers teaching preachers. We have adjunct faculty that are pastors during the weekend. They come in on certain days and teach our pastoral majors. Our secretarial majors are taught by ladies and people that have worked in secretarial for churches, for schools, and they learn hands-on from people that have been there, that have done that. And, you know, you may say, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like the Lord's called me into the ministry. Well, not everyone's called to be a pastor or a missionary, but everyone is called to be a full-time Christian. Whether you believe that the Lord will have you in full-time ministry or not, giving a year to God in Bible college is a great foundation to not only learn more about the Bible and learn more about what you believe and why you believe it, but learn things that will help you to be a blessing in your church. We go by churches all the time that say, hey, we need a piano player. Hey, we need a teacher for the Christian school. And those are things that could be filled by those of you that are sitting in the pew. And Bible college is a great way to learn the ministry hands-on from people that have been there and done that for years and years and years. I like to use my younger brother as an example. He graduated a couple weeks ago, started off and said, you know, I'll give God a year, but he didn't feel like the Lord had called him into the ministry. He just didn't feel like that's what the Lord had from all the way up through high school. Said, no, I'll give the Lord a year. And a couple weeks ago, he graduated. He's going on to be a youth pastor and teaching a Christian school, all from somebody who didn't feel like the Lord had anything for him ministry wise but simply said, Lord, I'll give you a year. And he allowed the Lord to work in his life. We unfortunately have a day and age where more people are coming out of the ministry, more people are giving up on the Lord, getting out of church than are going back in. But that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, starting this next semester, we are offering a new uh, one-year Bible certificate degree. For those of you that may say, you know what, I feel like the Lord's just going to have me be a faithful layperson in a church. You can come to the college, learn about the Bible, learn about the ministry, and get that training hands-on training on how you can better serve the Lord in the ministry. If you have any questions or you're interested in Bible college, feel free to talk to myself or one of the young ladies, and we'd be happy to give you some more information about the college. Thank you. I could tell of the stories when the thousand Ariana Drager. I'm from Prentice, Wisconsin, and this year I will be a junior majoring in elementary education. Hello, everyone. My name is Julissa Borkhart. I'm from Petoskey, Michigan, and this year I will be a junior majoring in general studies. You must be forgiven to make heaven your home. The good life. Stay in the city. 
Appreciate that from the young ladies and being willing to sing for us. Seem to go and take your Bibles, go to Numbers chapter 14 tonight, if you would. Encourage you after the service is over, go out to the back hallway. The uh, group has a table set up back there, and uh, especially young people get some information about the Bible College there. Uh, Brother Gomez has pr built a tremendous uh, ministry there, and uh, he has since retired. And uh, Brother Kavanaugh is carrying on the work there, and it is a it is a good place to consider uh, for sure. So I appreciate them stopping in and being with us tonight. Numbers chapter 14. We're continuing our study here of the life of Moses. This evening, um, beginning there at verse number one, the Bible tells us, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a certain, make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, uh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Father, help us tonight. Or as we look at this passage and we consider, uh, Lord, the decisions that were made by the children of Israel, Lord, I pray that we would take the warning that is contained in these uh, scriptures. We'd also take the admonition of, of doing right as well. Lord, I pray that you stir us, encourage us tonight from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, 
my wife and I, we got to, uh, we lived in Connecticut uh, as a married couple for uh, almost 17 years, I guess a little over 17 years. And while we were there, uh, I got to serve uh, under and, and, uh, and work with uh, Pastor Tom Bish, and you guys have got a chance to meet him. And, uh, and as I was working uh, with him up there for the, all those years, it seemed like that we would get into a certain uh, uh, season of, of his preaching, and uh, he would have a phrase that would show up uh, probably once every three sermons. And it was this here. Rebellion makes people stupid. That's the title of the sermon tonight. I got a title for you tonight, Brother Andrew. You've got one. Rebellion makes people stupid. It's amazing how dumb we get when we choose to rebel against God's Word and what His, uh, His paths are for our lives. It's amazing. It's, uh, working with teens for all those years that I did, uh, you know, there were a few that, that made that, that, you know, that wise statement, you know, whenever they got tired of mom and dad's rules and, and everything. And they said, well, as soon as I graduate high school or as soon as I uh, am 18 and I'm out of the house, uh, I'm, I'll be out beneath all their rules and I'm going to go join the army. And I had some that did. And they quickly realized mom and dad's rules were not that bad. Uh, it was, it's amazing how dumb we can get when we begin to demand our own way. And we let uh, things begin to get in the way of us here. This is where we find the people of Israel after they have heard the report from the ten spies. And we've heard Caleb and Joshua stand up and, and try to rebut that, uh, that, 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 that report they gave. And then the ten uh, got back up again and started to uh, work the crowd uh, one more time. Uh, they, they, they had the, 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 this group of twelve. They went into the same land. They saw the same uh, fruits. They saw the same cities. They saw the same people. Uh, but they had two very different viewpoints. What was it that affected their, their viewpoints? Uh, were the ten saw nothing but trouble from the blessing of God. Caleb and Joshua saw an opportunity for God to show Himself strong on their behalf. The decision of the people would come down to a simple decision. Would they trust God or not? It was simple, wasn't it? Will you trust God or not? We mentioned it last week, but let's consider it again. Had God let them down at all in the last two years since He had brought them out of Egypt? Had He come up short against Pharaoh and his magicians in Egypt? Had He been overwhelmed by the needs of the desert? Had the Amalekites proved to be too much for Him? And all of those have the same answer, and that's the resounding no. God was able to overcome all those things. And over and over and over again, God had proved Himself sufficient, yea, even more than enough. He, their, their, their blessings were abundant. Remember what He said, that when they went out to uh, take in all the manna every morning, that uh, nobody lacked for what they needed. God always provided more than what they, uh, they, he wasn't, they just weren't scraping by. God was blessing them abundantly in everything that He did, as long as they followed what He would have them do. It wasn't... God had proved Himself, if you will, that He was able, and by knowing His past track record, you know, you hear sometimes uh, past, uh, uh, you know, performance is not indicative of future earnings whenever you hear investments and things like that. Well, here's what you can take to the bank on this, is that uh, God's past performance is indicative of His future abilities as well. Uh, just as God was able to do it in the past, He's able to do it today and tomorrow and into the future, and we can trust Him. Uh, we can step out on faith and believe that He is able. He's waiting Waiting for us to believe him. Yeah. And he wanted his people to believe him. But there were naysayers. There were those who said, No, you can't be trusted. How could they miss the obvious provision of God over those last two years and come to the conclusion that he wasn't able to care for them now? You understand, they chose rebellion over faith in God. And those were the only two choices. And in our own lives tonight, we are facing those same things that we are either going to trust God and we're going to move forward in what He wants us to do, or we are going to rebel against Him. And rebellion never ends well. Never has. And so tonight, I want us to consider, first off, the evil effect of the ten. The evil effect of the ten. I want us to consider that because we have a world today that is shouting down anything that is godly. Right. Anything that is godly. Uh, 
the, uh, uh, if, you are, if you pay attention to the news, you saw here a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, an athlete uh, standing up at, his, uh, his, at a college that was, uh, uh, he's of the Catholic uh, uh, faith there, and he was standing at a Catholic college and giving a, a commencement address, and, and he was extolling the virtues of, uh, of, being a, of being a homemaker and being a mom to the young ladies and, and, and whatnot. And he has been just raked over the coals over these last few weeks because he dares stand for for traditional values. That's the world we live in today. That's the world we're up against. And if we are not careful, we will give more ear to the world around us that has no faith in God. And when it does, I want you to see how the people reacted here this evening very quickly. First off, I want you to see verse 1. There was fear and despair. There's fear and despair. Notice that all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, fearful of what was on the other side of the river, and in despair because they've come all this way, and now all these God's done has brought us here to kill us here. You understand, truth, the true faith found no place in them. They gave up all hope of entering the promised land. All because these ten guys said, oh, it's too tough. But God said, no, I, I want you in there. I'm going to lead you in there. I'm going to give you victory. And they chose to listen to those ten men. I like what one preacher said. He said this, both faith and belief beckon to us in life. Let me say that again. Both faith and unbelief beckon to us in life. In life, unbelief, like the majority report, is generally more popular and louder and gets more attention, but it's the way of sorrow. Hebrews 11.25 reminds us here that Moses, when he chose to turn away from those things that Egypt had, the Bible says that he chose to turn away from the pleasure of sin. Why? Because it was only for a season. And that season, which is extremely short at its best, is only in this life. It is not an eternity. Fear and despair. But also this here, notice also a second uh, a reaction because they have listened to the wrong voices. We don't just find fear and despair, but we find also murmuring and complaining. Isn't it amazing how often murmuring and complaining follows after those who refuse to walk by faith? Murmuring and complaining. Notice who they're murmuring against. Verse 2 there again, uh, Moses. And this time, Aaron was the object as well. This is the first time Aaron's been murmured against. He's, he's, he's tasted a little bit what his brother, just a chapter or two before, Aaron was murmuring against his brother Moses. He and his sister, remember that? And now all of a sudden the shoe's on the other foot. He's getting a little taste of it himself. But of course we know Moses has been used to this. He's heard this for the last two years. Murmuring and complaining. Unbelief always attacks those who represent faith. You have those who are willing to step out by faith, and they're willing to go forward for God and, and follow what God's leading is. Uh, there will be plenty of naysayers along the way who say, oh, we can't do that. It's not about what we can do. It's about what God wants to do. Yes, the Israelites were outnumbered. Yes, the Israelites were, were weaker than the, the foes they were going to step into. But that's not who was fighting the battles. In fact, when the next generation came in and God brought them in, it still wasn't them fighting the battle. It was God fighting the battle. From the very first battle when He said, walk around the city of Jericho, you think they knocked those walls down? No, God did that. And God would have done it 40 years before if they had just followed Him into the cities, or into the, to the land that He had for Him. Unbelief. Unbelief brings about murmuring. It brings about complaining. Matthew Henry said it this way, How base were the spirits of these degenerate Israelites who rather than die like soldiers on the bed of honor with their swords in their hands, desire to die like rotten sheep in the wilderness. He's got some real zingers. But you see what they said there in verse th uh, there, uh, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? Well, if you're so, uh, uh, so inclined to die, just go in the land and go and fight then. You can take care of it there. But they were just looking for reasons to complain and to murmur. I want you to see this as well. Uh, that they had accusations, not just against the, uh, the, the leadership, they had accusations against God. Verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? God did this. They accused God of bringing them that far to kill them. Had they been privy to the conversation in Exodus chapter 33... When God said, I'm going to wipe them out. Yeah. 
And Moses said, no, don't do that. And Moses begged for God not to wipe them out. He went on their behalf. Had they known uh, what? They didn't know this here. And now they're saying, oh, God just brought us out here to kill us. No, he didn't. He's been preserving you all along the way. He's been watching over you. And, you know, it's amazing how people uh, turn to accuse God of wrongdoing, isn't it? When they reject God over and over again, yet when trouble comes, they blame God for all their troubles. How could a loving God, they be usually begin. And yet you've ignored God all your life and you've never acknowledged Him one time. You never lived after a single precept of His. And yet you expect Him to take care of everything for you and let you live in your own sinful ways. How foolish. How foolish. But that's the mindset. Also look at verse 4. And they said to one another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. That was rebellion against God's Word. There's fear and despair. There's murmuring and complaining. There's accusations against God. And now we got a just straight up rebellion against God. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the Bible tells us here as Moses was recounting these things to the children of Israel before they went into the land uh, after that generation died off, he said, Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You see, it wasn't an option for them to go in. God had told them they were supposed to go forward. But they rebelled against God's word, and he continues on. He says, And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. They were going to rebel against God. They were going to go back to Egypt. Hey, let's stop and think about that. If they're going to go back to Egypt, guess what they don't have going with them? There's no cloud by day, and there's no fire by night. There's no manna every morning when you get up. There's no water from the rock to take care of you as you're going through the desert. Your clothes are going to wear out. Furthermore, how are you going to get across the Red Sea? Or if you go back the way to avoid the Red Sea, uh, you think you're going to get through that land with all the uh, ites around there that want to take you out? Furthermore, imagine this same group walking back and coming into Egypt again. How well do you think they'd be welcomed? Totally, uh, just it doesn't make any sense. Why? Because rebellion makes you stupid. It's what it does. But here's the thing many times Satan convinces us that we had it so much better before we were saved. Satan convinces us when we were living in the carnality and the pig pen of sin how much easier it was. And oh, we had freedom then, but now we have to live according to the Bible and, and we're all bound up. No, sir. Uh, you were living in a place that was, uh, was destitute and had no help and there was no light of day and there was just darkness and despair all around you. And when God came into your life and He brought you into uh, and, and saved your soul and brought you into this good life here and He's given you blessings uh, untold and, and you're going back and saying, oh, uh, if God would, He just was he's not good I'm going to go back to my old ways they decided to rebel against God's leadership Moses was the man God had chosen they said let us make a captain yeah. rejecting God's leadership rejecting what God had for them listen when God's leadership is following him and you decide to rebel against it you are only left with rebellious destructive paths to walk that's what you're left with. I want you to see here, secondly, tonight is this here is the beseeching of the faithful. Beseeching of the faithful. First off, we find Moses and Aaron. The Bible tells they fall on their face. It's a place of humility. Not, not the pridefulness that we see in the ten spies, but we find a, a humility about them, and they fall on their faces begging them not to reject God's ways. Begging them to follow what He would have them to do. Begging them to, to listen and go forward. They're, they're begging them to listen. Hey, don't, don't turn your back on God. Don't turn your back on His blessings. Can you imagine Aaron and Moses? They have endured uh, these things with these people here, especially Moses. I can see Moses saying, please don't, please don't take this away from me. There's Caleb and Joshua, the Bible says in verse 6, and they rent their clothes. It's a sign of mourning. What are they mourning about? They're mourning about an evil decision. 
They're mourning because they see the path they're going down and they know it's a path of destruction and they, they are begging them. They're, they're showing their, their disdain. They, they rent their clothes as a, as a picture of mournfulness over a decision that was being made right here. And I like this here in verse 7, they begin to speak up. They don't stay. Listen, the majority is speaking against them. The ten spies have spoken against him. The majority of the people are against him, but they're going to give their witness one more time. Listen, it doesn't matter how, how, how bad things look. It doesn't matter how, how awful they look going forward. Listen, it is always worth witnessing for the Lord. It's always speaking up and saying, thus saith the Lord, here's what the Bible says, here's where we're going to stand. Even if everybody else is against it, we say, no, here's what the Bible says, we're going to stand with the book, we're going to stand with what God says. Listen, be a voice, speak up for those things there. First off, look at verse 7 uh, here. Uh, I want you to see a real quick four things here that they, they give a witness to. First off is this here, is that God's Word is true. Verse 7, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through the search it is an exceeding good land. What they're saying is, look, God said it was good. Uh, he's, a, he's a God of His Word. Uh, you can trust God. He's been faithful to us all along. Hey, you can, we can follow Him. He said to go forward. We can trust Him going forward. God will take care of us. God will be true to His Word. Listen, friend, there's got to be some things. We've got to stop uh, going to our own reasoning and coming to our own conclusions and quit trusting in ourselves and quit leaning on our own understanding and turn from those things and begin to acknowledge Him in all our ways and let Him direct our paths. They're begging, listen, God's Word is true, but also see this here, uh, verse 8, If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it us. Listen, if we will just be faithful to God, I promise you He's going to be faithful to us. There is blessing of God. When we are obedient to His Word, there is the blessing of God that is sure to follow. They were sure of God's blessing. They knew God would bless them if they would simply obey. But they also know, knew this here. If we turn away from God's Word and we refuse to obey and we live in disobedience, we have nothing left but the chastisement of God upon us. And if we belong to God, and you're saved in here tonight, and you're His child, and you belong to Him, as a good father does, He will chastise His rebellious ones. No father in his right mind enjoys having to chastise his children. But he knows that they're going to make it, and they're not going to be just destroying their own lives. They have to do it for the sake of their children. That's why Paul Solomon told his son, spare not for his crying. I know it's going to hurt him right now, but for the long run it's going to spare him down the road. Number three, verse nine, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Don't rebel. Everybody could see it. Caleb and Joshua and Moses and Aaron, listen, be thankful that if you have somebody who will stand up and say, hey, you're going the wrong direction, you're going down a destructive path, hey, don't go that way, hey, turn around, uh, stop here, hey, be thankful you've got a friend. The Bible tells that, that the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. Listen, you want a friend who will tell you the truth. You want a friend who will tell hey, listen, you're going down the wrong path, you're going you're gonna to destroy yourself. Hey, pay attention, that's what Caleb and Joshua are doing. Hey, listen, this is rebellion against God. This is not a good thing. We're inviting the judgment of God upon us. Don't do it. There's a warning given. God's Word is true. God's blessing is steadfast. Hey, let's not rebel, but at the end of this verse here, they said this here, fear ye not, the, or, and neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. In other words, we're going to eat them up. Their defense is departed for them. Why? The Lord is with us. Fear them not. What a blessing to know that God is with us. What a blessing that we know that God goes with us. When we go out and we're living in obedience to Him, and we, uh, we are walking in the Spirit, and we know we've got the power of the Lord on our lives, what a blessing it is to go forward knowing His presence in our life. But they knew this here, if we rebel against God, we, we are walking in danger. Verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. When men's hearts are set on doing evil, they will attack. 
with cruelty anything that represents opposition and their evil. You, you don't do it to us, but we're okay to do it to you. When one dares to proclaim or live God's way, he's exposing himself to the potential of cruel treatment. And I believe Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb would have been stoned right there had it not been for the end of verse 10. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. God showed up. God showed up. God does not forsake His faithful servants. God delivers them from hostilities in due time. Matthew Henry made this observation. He said, those who faithfully expose themselves for God are sure to be taken under His special protection and shall be hidden from the rage of men either under heaven or in heaven. There are folks who, even today, are martyred for the cause of Christ. You say, well, where was God whenever that happened? Listen, they're doing a whole lot better today than they ever were on this earth. Well, if that, that just seems so cruel. That just seems so, so terrible that God would let such a thing happen. God simply brought them on home and allowed them to come home. Hebrews 11 says, tells us at the end of that, after we go through all those wonderful things that God did, He said, and some, oh, and some, oh, some did not. They weren't spared. They said they'd rather have a greater resurrection, if you will, a greater eternity, because they were willing to lay their life down and be a witness for Christ. The fulfillment of the promise of God was staring them in their faces. And what they did is they let the evil report of a few about God turn them away. This world has much to say against God and His ways. A man can stand in front of a, uh, I already referenced this here, a man can stand in front of a, a religious university and extol the virtue of, the, of following the Bible in a speech, giving it a graduation, have the world and its media demonize him because he believes God. And you can be sure this world will do the same thing to us. A high school, a high school student can, give, can have his diploma withheld because he dared to witness to God's goodness in his life as he gave his valedictorian, uh, valedictorian speech. This happened this last week. Primetime television swings away at the foundations of morality in our nation daily. The ten spies of the world are telling our young people in school, our homes on television, and us as individuals on social media, that the ways of God are terrible and will steal away your life. The question is simply this tonight, who will you listen to? Will you listen to those around you telling that living according to the Bible will waste your life? Or will you listen to that one who is pointing you to, the, to God's ways and His Word? At some point we must decide, will we, will we not let this world have its way in our lives, in our homes, in our schools, in our churches, in our, our towns, in our communities, in our society? Not only do we need to be listening to the right voices, we need to be the right voice as well. Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Uh, and, uh, one man said it this way, that no man is an island unto himself. Listen, you are influencing somebody today. Whether you say something or you remain silent, you are influencing. I don't know, maybe there was somebody else in the crowd who was okay, who agreed with Caleb and Joshua, but, but they just didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to stick out. They didn't want to happen to get stoned as well. Will you be willing to look square at the stones and stand for right even though it may cost you your life? It may be your friends, it may be your family, it may be your job, it may be your very existence. The disciples didn't hesitate to proclaim the message of the gospel because the Lord told them to, even though they were threatened many times and even some being martyred for their witness like Stephen and James, don't fall for the old lie of the devil that God is holding out on you. Remember what the men said, the Lord is with us. Fear them not. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, that verse ends out by reminding us of this wonderful promise. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. 
people of Israel saw the evidence. God told them it was a land full of milk and honey. The fruit of the land was wonderful and God was going to go in and He was going to fight their battles for them. But there were some people who went into the land who had no vision of God, who had no faith in God, who had no trust in God, and they gave ear to those ten men and they let those ten men rob them of their blessing. You want to let somebody rob you of your blessing from God and cause you to turn away from believing Him? He simply wants you to just live trusting Him. Your heart gripped by fear and despair. You find yourself complaining and whining a whole lot about everything around you. You find yourself saying, well, if God would and if God did and if God really cared, those are all... Those are all red flags saying I'm being influenced by the, by the ways of the world. Listen, we need to get ourselves back where we can be reminded that God's Word is true and God's love is everlasting and God loves us and He is there for us. He will not forsake us. He will not uh, leave us alone. Uh, he wants to walk us through those valleys. He wants to give us victory over those things. And we can stand on His Word and know He is true to His Word. That's the way He wants us to live and go forward by faith. But pastor, there's giants. You bet there are. Pastor, there's, there's, there's walled cities. You bet there are. But my God is bigger. My God is bigger. But there's also milk and honey. There's also the grapes of Eskel. There's also a, a wonderful land where uh, God is going to take care of us, a, a large land, a, a big enough for us to, to all dwell in without any problem. Hey, he's got the blessings there for us if we will simply not rebel. Rebellion makes people stupid because it makes them turn away from His Word. Don't be rebellious. Don't be like the people of Israel. Father, help us tonight.